Okay, so we're, that's fine. we're starting tonight's meeting with uh, with a public hearing, uh, as we're required to by law, regarding changes to the district code of conduct. Uh, we'll note for the record that there are no members of the public here at this time, but we will uh, at least uh, have some discussion or presentation, such as it is regarding the. Uh, the code of conduct, uh, just to bring everybody up to speed, the code of conduct is a board policy, board policy 5300. It is mandated by the state of New York. It has been since early 2000, 2000 the dates are on the last page, 2002. Um, we are required to uh, convene a, uh, a stakeholder committee every spring to review the code of conduct and make suggestions for um, for any changes to the code of conduct. Uh, so we uh, we did that in in early June, um, and in your packets at your places, uh, as well as via uh, digitally uh, yesterday, um, there were two. Uh, two documents and uh, although we're not voting on them now we're just discussing them now uh, at your places is a 6.2.1.1 which is only those pages from the rather lengthy full board policy uh, that have any recommended by the committee changes and then I did provide you with the full text of the policy also with the proposed changes included there in case uh, you wanted the, the larger text for, for context in any, in any way, shape, or form. Um, later in the meeting as part of um, a regular meeting board agenda uh, 6.2, there are three policies for a first reading. Uh, one of them is 5300. The other two are policies that were reviewed and uh, have been recommended by the policy committee for a first reading. Uh, we will do a second and final reading and adoption of hopefully all three of these policies at our next meeting on July 31st. That's the the game plan. Uh, so uh, the uh, the changes recommended by the uh, uh, the ad hoc code of conduct committee uh, were not uh, were neither numerous nor, in in my opinion, uh, terribly earth shattering. Uh, if you look on page three. Uh, there, there was a request to include the language from the Federal Gun Free Schools Act um, and um, then to, to clarify uh, a few of the other um, types of weapons that are not called out specifically in the federal statute, uh, specifically and pellet guns and identifying pocket knives with a blade greater than 2.5 inches in length. Uh, everything else there uh, is, uh, is the same as, as it was in the past. Um, the, uh, the, you should note that violations of the Federal Gun Free Schools Act um, requires a one year suspension out of school except it gives the superintendent of schools the latitude to waive the one-year suspension out of school. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's kind of odd that it's required, but the superintendent is permitted under the federal statute to use his or her discretion as to whether a one-year out-of-school suspension is warranted. Um, so just again, just so you're aware of that. Um, Joe. Yes. 
So the, the, the code of conduct refers generally to students. Correct. Um, and the, the Gun Free Schools Act, does that mean um, staff or visitors to our school? Does that apply to them as far as carrying a weapon? It, yes, my understanding is it would apply to anyone. I think it was written specifically targeted towards students, but it could apply to anyone. In fact, the, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that, not specific to the Gun Free Schools Act, but um, the question did come up about uh, other parts of the code of conduct uh, and whether they apply to spectators of a basketball game or a soccer game or whatever, or come, somebody coming to a concert or, or whatever. And um, they, they do. So then the question was raised, well, how do visitors of the school know what our code of conduct states? And I mean, it's a great question, especially when you don't know, you know, somebody comes from a school district on the eastern side of the county to a basketball game here, and they're not going to reach the kind of people who would potentially violate this are probably not the kind of people who are going to go onto our website and look it up and say, hey, can I wear a shirt that says F.U. Rhinebeck? Uh, yeah, they're not going to do that. Um, so what's, what's, our, what's our alternative? And what kind of penalties can we realistically levy on people who aren't from here? Uh, we can ban them from ever coming back to the, to the campus. And we've, we've done that a handful of times over the years, especially somebody who's being rowdy and obnoxious, and we, we had to show them the door and continue to be rowdy and rude and obnoxious, at which point we had to say, well, listen, if you, if you don't stop and leave quietly now, we're going to have to ask you not to come back for a prolonged period of time. And we have done that, and we've, we've written them a letter and put our police officers on notice that these, these people are not allowed back and they've never come back. They could, but we would then have to deal with it. So somebody mentioned in, in the Code of Conduct Committee that we, um, which I'm not sure how much it helps really, but uh, uh, you know those, those little uh, squares that you see that you can you can hit with your cell phone and then you know call up something. Somebody said, well, why don't we put those on the doors of places where visitors would be here and that way people could pull it up. Again, whether they would or not, I don't know. Uh, we have visitors in lots of different places around our school, not just at our basketball games. So. Again, it was just raised a suggestion. It's not in the. It's not addressed in the code of conduct one way or the other. But and that's a long-winded way of saying <laughs> yeah. yes. The visitors are responsible to the code of conduct, even though there's not that difficulty. Right. In, they're not knowing what it is. Yeah, yeah. So, sure. uh, so I think I read it somewhere. Um, that so the current door SROs carry weapons? Our SROs carry weapons, yes. They do. do did we have to um, make policy or something for them to do that? And how no. would that apply out? Like we have parents that are police officers also. Yeah. Uh, they, they, or, and they if, my understanding is if the only people who are allowed by state law to carry weapons in the school are uniformed law enforcement officials. Not a parent who happens to be a policeman who, or a policewoman who carries their weapon with them. They're not on duty. They're not here in any official yeah, capacity. They're in their uniform. If they're in uniform, it's still not an official capacity. And so. on duty, I think, is the other thing. Yeah. In uniform, on duty. They must. So have. we didn't have to do any, put anything no. in writing about that. No. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, I'll just keep buzzing through this. Uh, and we can save ourselves a little bit of time later in the meeting. Um, uh, no, page nine, again, uh, uh, I think that must have come from one of, one of our building principles, uh, uh, expanding the idea of stealing, also covering being in authorized possession of somebody's 
somebody else's property, a property that does not belong to them. Uh, page 10, uh, there are a couple of small uh, redacts uh, with these would be the strike throughs and the inclusion of vaping and juuling paraphernalia as that's become more of a phenomenon here even since we did our code of conduct revisions last summer. Uh, page 16, uh, there was uh, a request on the part of uh, uh, I believe it was Dr. Davenport to uh, just to tweak the uh, the wording uh, on item number 12 uh, to refer to weapons which are referred to in the section we we read earlier in this uh, in this uh, on this page of, of uh, uh, recommended changes and also to clarify a dangerous instrument because uh, I mean uh, technically uh, you know a sharpened pencil could be a dangerous instrument if somebody is prone to use it as a as a weapon um, so that, that's the change on page 16 as well as the top of uh, uh, top of 17 and uh, on 18 I took the liberty of taking out walking style. Uh, I heard, I heard something someplace over the last couple of weeks about you know, the changes in listening technology and how you know, walk-ins used to be the big thing and then when I was going through this a couple of days ago I noticed it still said walkman so I'm thinking who uses a walkman other than a, an antique dealer anymore so uh, I did take that out although it covers all the other kinds of music players uh, that, I guess that, I guess if we ever stage a musical of the Guardians of the Galaxy, we're gonna have to work. <laughs> we'll write it back in at that point. Uh, then uh, again, uh, 48 is consistent with the previous change about stealing to include theft or unauthorized possession of personal property. Um, the uh, the committee. Uh, you also notice uh, an addition of one, two, and three um, at the end of item 48. Uh, those those items, which are uh, let's see, on page 15 of the full text, um, just again, if you want to reference it, one is an oral warning, two is referral to a building administrator. Three is notification of parent. Um, the uh, uh, the and there are those items are in many of the other items there, but for some reason, uh, probably an in inadvertent omission, the committee felt that they should be there. Although it does not require us to uh, to start at number one. It all you know it's all situational. It depends on. The gravity of the offense. So, you know, uh, little Johnny in kindergarten who steals somebody else's lollipop, uh, that might be, you know, appropriate for one of the the lower level uh, consequences. I, I reminded the the committee, and I'll remind the board as well that this is a K-12 policy. So, there's a great deal of latitude in terms of severity of consequences and something that a child in the elementary school might do would probably not be dealt with with the most serious consequence again depending on what was done and uh, so there's there's a lot of because it's a k-12 policy there's a lot of flexibility uh, there's also I'm not sure if it's in this document or uh, elsewhere in the policy because it didn't, it didn't come up to the discussion point but uh, I, but I think it's in here someplace uh, a building principal who feels that it is uh, necessary either to uh, levy a more severe punishment or a less severe punishment than what is in the range of consequences for a particular offense must first 
bring it to the superintendent of schools to clear it, to explain the rationale why that's way too severe for this particular circumstance or not severe enough. So they can't just freelance that. If it's not within that range of consequences spelled out, they have to bring it to me, present the case to me, and then I either say, yeah, I agree, that makes sense, or uh, no, I, I disagree with you, stick with the policy, just so you know we have that latitude to, uh, to make those decisions depending on the, the particular uh, behavior. Uh, and then on page 46, um, even though there is a section in the District Code of Conduct that was added several years ago, though not a lot of years ago when the Dignity for All Students Act was, uh, was enacted in New York State, uh, which addresses uh, um, bullying in a, in a way that it had not previously, uh, the uh, Dignity for All Students Act does address uh, protected classes under uh, under state law in particular, you know, it's, it, it took the, the bullying uh, concept from beyond what we had traditionally thought of as uh, bullying, uh, you know, gender bullying or whatever, and included uh, manner of dress, for example, and that was not previously considered a protected class if you dressed differently from your peers, but now it is. Uh, uh, a, a child's weight is now, for purposes of this policy, a protected class. So if a kid is bullied because he's overweight, underweight, whatever, uh, that's, that's still bullying. It's not uh, something that isn't a protected class now. It's pretty much, pretty much everything's a protected class to be to be honest with you. I mean, anything that differentiate, might differentiate one student from his or her peers is called out in, in state legislature, any, uh, state, state legislation in Indasa as being a protected class. So uh, one of the parents felt that even though we had a section on it in here, uh, it probably couldn't hurt to put it in there. And it certainly doesn't, doesn't take away from what's in other parts of this policy, so it seemed it seemed like a not unreasonable uh, request uh, to do that. So those are the the recommendations that uh, that the committee uh, requested. Uh, the committee uh, that does did that hoc committee did include parents as well as teachers. Uh, non there was a non instructional staff member, I believe. Uh, several. Uh, administrators. Uh, we did invite two students uh, from the high school. They they didn't show up, and uh, I mean in other years they have, to be honest. But they they had a conflict or forgot or whatever. But we did invite students to participate, um, and uh, so that's that's our process and the committee's recommendations uh, up to this point. Yeah. I one other question on um, page 17. Yeah, let me get to it. Yeah. So I, I understand possession of use of a, a weapon, confiscation of a knife, or, you know, obvious weapon. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand like, what you're saying. A pencil could be a weapon, an instrument, or a backpack, and that's, you know, there's not an issue with students having that. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm wondering about um, something like a bat that a baseball player would bring, or a cross stick, or something that could obviously be a weapon, <coughs> but a student would have a legitimate reason to have you. Mm -hmm. Are they no longer allowed to bring those no. to school, or what's... No, because they, it's, it states, a dangerous instrument is defined as any object that could, could be used as a weapon, and that is used, attempted to be used, and or threatened to be used. So if somebody brings a baseball back to school and threatens somebody with, with being beat upside the head with that baseball bat, now that puts it into the dangerous object category. If they just bring it to bring it to baseball practice, they're not threatening anybody with it, they're not swinging it at somebody, they're not trying to hit somebody with it, so that's that's fine. Right, but that's the, not a prohibition. Set, I mean, it says possession, right? Or use of. Right. So, well, 
Well, a dangerous instrument is defined as one that you use or intend to use for a bad purpose. Okay. So, other way, if not, a pencil. You know, not every kid who carries a pencil intends yeah. to use it as a weapon, but if you're lunging towards somebody to plant it in that kid's head, then you've, you've crossed that line, given your intent or your use of what would ordinarily be a writing implement. Of course, this definition does not specifically call out intent. It's implied that the person intends to use it, but in uh, in a, uh, a situation where somebody was, you know, waving around a sharpened pencil, as kids have been known to do, mm -hmm. and put somebody's eye out with it, not intending to do that, but having mm -hmm. that effect, in theory, this policy could be used to penalize that person, and we should consider if intent is something that we want to import into this, whether we should say that explicitly mm -hmm. to avoid unintended consequences. So I'll, I'll ask the attorney on the board. <laughs> We're soon to be on the board anyway. As you've been so useful in past years uh, uh -huh. as a member of the, uh, the policy committee, what words or phrase would you insert into that to to also, I'm uh, not sure, state intent or to make intent more, more um, clear. Well, I, I and I'm, not, I'm, trying, I'm not sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, no. And you can get back to me on that. I mean. Yeah, I, 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 might, I might get back to you okay. on the specifics, but I would certainly use the word intent if intent mm -hmm. is something that we would, would want to be sure was a consideration mm -hmm. for whoever was going to be considering the application of okay. policy. Um, I do actually have a few questions. Yeah, sure. Can we stick on that one a second? Yeah. I mean, I agree with Lisa, but I think some of that might be covered in, in kind of the procedures and, and the people involved in making those claims, right? So the teacher, for example, that was in a classroom would know whether it was intent or not, right? Mm -hmm. Whether she brought he brought it forward or thought it was an accident or, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if it explicitly needs to be there because I think it is covered through kind of responsibility of the person observing. Well, I'll, I'll just say that I recently dealt with the matter as an attorney uh, involving, shall we say, a neighboring school district. Um, in which the issue was, what was the intent of the, uh, the student who was uh, subject to the disciplinary action, um, and whether that action was appropriate to the conduct. And, you know, opinions can differ as to whether a, something that looks like a bad thing to the, the staff member was intended as a bad thing by the student. So I, I I hear your point, but I think it's always better to be more explicit yeah, I mean, rather just, than less Yeah, I mean, it's just it's still going to be a subjective call. I think that's right. right but, yeah, ultimately, a lot of these things yeah. are subjective, but that's fine. I mean, I, well, it gives the cleaner it, it the gives better. The district more coverage than yeah. Right. I certainly support the idea of mm -hmm. not getting tripped up in well, you didn't state intent here, so now right. you can't do it. You can yeah. Right. And we're going to go to the Commission of Education and yeah. fight with you about that. Yeah. Right, because couldn't it be an issue then if I bought a knife to school, but I don't intend to hurt anyone with it, I'm just afraid. Mm -hmm. it, could, it could If be. you put it in the policy, that would be mm -hmm. good one. It could be. And some, you know, it's not unheard of that things well, like we, that happen. We have had that more often than just about any other thing. Uh, you know, a kid, you know, a, a kid, uh, a kid's fishing before school and comes into school and he left his pocket knife in his in his coat and he comes in and uh, it falls out of his coat now here's a knife did he intend to no and so we t we tend to take that into consideration that yeah, okay don't do it again we're taking it away from you your parents have to come and get it if you bring it again we're not going to consider that you just it's not an oops a second time, we get it, we understand. Okay, you didn't brandish it, you weren't, you know, lunging at somebody, kidding around, or seriously, okay, we get it. Yeah. That's that's it. So there's a lot of judgment call sure. uh, in, involved. But if, if you have any anything to share, Lisa, I would I will I, I would be happy to hear from you. I'll be happy to do that. Before our next okay. meeting. Um 
I do, so I do have a couple of yeah. questions. Um, first one goes back to page three um, okay. in the definitional section on weapons. Mm -hmm. So where is the um, the specification about uh, a blade greater than 2.5 inches in length from? Where did that originate? Uh, I think it. Uh, I think Ed Davenport showed it to me in the in the school law book. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And that was kind of a new a new thing to me because that had never been in our policy before. Okay. All right. I was just wondering. Yeah. It's very specific, so I thought yeah. maybe it was yeah. something behind it. Um, turning to page nine, yep. E three. Yeah. Um, so. The, the phrase being in unauthorized possession raises all kinds of questions in my mind, mm -hmm. um, which I guess you could really summarize as, um, what does that mean to be in unauthorized possession? So I, a lot of that's gonna depend on the specifics of the situation, sure. but you know, it's just fuzzy enough that it makes me a little uncomfortable for the district again mm -hmm. about, you know, are you going to be getting into a fight with the student or the student's parents every time, you know, this policy is applied to somebody. Um, stealing's clear, mm -hmm. you know, you took something that didn't belong to you from somebody to whom it belonged. But, you know, what, what is, being in unauthorized possession add to that, and if there's something else specifically that the committee is thinking about, yeah. well, I what think is the, it? Yeah, well, I think the example I was given, if I'm remembering correctly, was uh, Johnny's in school, he, ha he has a laptop. Mm -hmm. Somebody takes his laptop or it turns up missing. Now he's concerned that somebody's taken his possessions and in doing a proper interrogation and search, uh, the laptop turns up in somebody else's possession. It's, it's in his backpack. Right. Well, this, is this your laptop, John? Uh, Jimmy. Billy, Jimmy, whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I don't know how it got there. Uh, no, I, I don't know where that came from. Uh -huh. Well, it, this is clearly Johnny's laptop, it's got his name etched into the into the back of it. It's clearly not yours. What are you doing with why why do you have it's like possession of stolen property, right? I guess, uh, if I could come up with an analog to the to the to the to the lay world. So it's not you're, yours. So you're saying it doesn't fall under stealing because the Jimmy didn't actually take it necessarily take it from Johnny, he might uh, have I think that was that was the point that uh, it may not always be, it may not be a possibility for the school administrator to prove that Jimmy took that laptop off Johnny's desk and put it into his backpack, but he's in possession of it. He's not carrying it around a backpack without realizing he's got the extra weight of that backpack. It's not like, oh, where did that go? Oh, I didn't even know there was a backpack. Right. There was a, a laptop in my backpack. Come on, Jimmy. Yeah. I mean, I hear, I hear the point. I do think that it's just vague enough that it might create issues going forward. But you know, I just wanted to flag that. Mm -hmm. um, there are certainly going to be instances where it can be clearly applied. And I think that the example that you gave is a good one. Um, uh, I also, on uh, page 17, uh, item 15. I, I don't have an issue with the definition itself, mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate the you know the discussion that we had, notwithstanding. Um, but in what may be an excessively lawyerly uh, comment, um, I think that this is a definition that should be in the definitional section because that's where people look for definitions, and um, these code sections are kind of like sponges. They kind of soak stuff up over the years and more and more stuff gets added mm -hmm. as people notice it or things come up. Um, and it's probably a good idea not to you know, overload substantive sections with definitions. I don't, I, my sense is 
given your comment, mm -hmm. although I, I will check back with our school administrators, but I'm my sense is that they wouldn't be opposed to cutting and pasting that yeah. into the definitional section. Yeah. As long as it's there and they can refer to it. Yeah. It's in one spot, yeah. referenced another, yeah. right? So it's yeah. not defined differently in different mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. And and then the only other thing that I had was on page 18, paragraph 34. So obviously I don't yeah. have an objection to this, <laughs> the substantive changes, but um, it's kind of the same issue. You know, this is a section that I would guess has been. Um, the, the recipient of many sort of add-ins over the years, and I tried to read it and to figure out what was prohibited and what was permitted, and it took me a few tries before I thought I sorted it out. And if that's the case, when I'm reading it, I've got to think that other people reading it are going to have a tougher time, or at least as tough a time. Um, and so what I wanted to suggest, not as an objection to approving these changes, mm -hmm. but you know, for the, the policy committee or the code of conduct committee um, to take up the question of whether this section can be rejiggered to make it clearer. And you know, they might want to break it up into subsections, um, or they might want to uh, you know, rethink it in terms of categories rather than, you know, the kinds of specifics that we're seeing here, you know, just so that when somebody needs to read it and figure out what's in and what's out, that they don't have to, you know, it's not a biblical text. It shouldn't be, requ require that kind of exegesis. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I think that probably having the, the policy committee look at it would make the most sense mm -hmm. with to me, a because they they have the the time over the mm -hmm. the course of months to have that discussion, and um, you know when, when you're when you're asking uh, especially lay people to come in on an ad hoc committee, sure. uh, I, I'm the last guy to want to give them a, a six month task to unravel that, but uh, I, I'm not opposed to working with the policy committee on something like that, so I... Yeah. I just didn't um, want to presume yeah. it was the, the best... Um, yeah, and I, I think... To deal with it. I, think, I think so, but mm -hmm. we can hear from the policy committee when <laughs> they reconvene in the in a new school year, too. Okay. Points one second. That's all I got. Mm -hmm. uh, did, would anybody in the audience like to raise a question <laughs> about uh, those changes? Yeah. Okay, hearing... Hearing none, um, I will still ask you to uh, to vote uh, as a first reading later, so at least we can get it moving forward, and then we'll take up some of the suggestions that that have been made before the the uh, second and final reading on July 31st. Okay, cool. Um, so at this point, I would uh, I would suggest that we close this hearing on changes to the 2018-19 Code of Conduct. And uh, we can, uh, I guess I'll turn it over to uh, the clerk of the board to uh, start the uh, organization meeting agenda. So whenever you're ready, Whitney, I think we're ready to dig into that. <laughs> Returning board member, who was appointed June 12, 2018, um, board meeting to fill the vacancy due to the designation of Deacon And she will serve until the next annual election of board members on May 21st, 2019. And then we have <coughs> two newly re elected of this board members, Diane Lyons and Mark Foshner, elected to three year terms. and. To get both. Can I do them all at once? And no, them. Okay. I think you have to do it separately. Well, I know, but. Okay. But you can <laughs> do them all now. Yes. Okay, so. Um, Mark Foshner, Lisa. Um, Mark Foshner, Lisa. Um, Mark Foshner, Lisa. 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 Mark Foshner, Lisa
Do I have to raise my right hand? Uh, I think so. That's right. I, Lisa Rosenfeld, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of trustee according to the best of my ability. I, Diane Lyons, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and I will faithfully discharge the duties of trustee according to the best of my life. I, Mark Fleischauer, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New York, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of trustee according to the best of my ability. when you're not here? as clerk of the Board of Education. Well, we, we, we skip, we skip, skip something? Yes. Yeah. Right up here. Poll for nominations oh. to the 
Oh, okay. Sorry. No, sorry. Um, okay. The, um, I have nominations to the position of executive committee member for the 2018-19 school year for the Dutchess County School Boards Association. We have more. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll do nominate for flesh out. Second. Uh, any discussion? Thank you, Mark. Um, Good to vote it. Yes. All right. Um, all in favor? <laughs> Sorry, this might take a little bit. <laughs> okay, the motion passes. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, now we can go to this yep. one at a time. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Before you go on, uh, the the next item is other leadership positions and committee assignments of the Board of Education. Okay. And at your places are those items that I believe you had down there collected before she left the, the board. Uh, so I would suggest giving them a quick a quick glance to make sure that they are accurate. There's nothing to vote on, but just uh, uh -huh. want to record the fact that everybody is amenable to the items on that list and then we can start voting. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, now you go All right. Uh, I have a motion to appoint Whitney Drucker as, as clerk of the Board of Education for the 2018-2019 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor. Uh, all in favor. That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Christine Natoli as school district treasurer for the 2018-19 school year with the appointment of Elizabeth Van Curen as deputy school treasurer for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Carolyn Peck as central treasurer for the extra classroom activity fund for the 2018-19 school year at a stipend of 2612 So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Susan McCormick as school tax collector for the 2018-19 school year at no additional stipend. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Steve Banger as claims auditor the, at the rate of $29.18 per hour or minimum of $125 per day for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Thomas Brunell, assistant superintendent for support services as district purchasing agent and Joseph L. Fallon, superintendent of schools as deputy purchasing agent for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Marvin Kreps as Title Title IX, Title VII Coordinator, mm -hmm. Title VI Coordinator, and Non-Discrimination Complaint Officer for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Christine Natoli, District Treasurer, as additional Title IX, Title VII Coordinator, Title VI Coordinator, and Non-Discrimination Complaint Officer on an as-needed basis for the 2018-19 school year with compensation for related investigations at her hourly rate. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. I have a motion to appoint Emily Davison. Director of Special Education as Section 504 ADA Coordinator for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. Can I have a motion to appoint Joseph L. Fallon, Superintendent of Schools, as designated education official for the 2018-19 school year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? I have a motion to appoint Joseph F. Fallon, Superintendent of Schools, as age coordinator for the 2018-19 school year at no additional site. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, forgive me if I've forgotten. This was explained before, but what is age coordinator? I believe it's like age discrimination issues. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All in favor? That motion passes. 
motion passes. Okay. I have a motion to designate Emily Davison, Director of Special Education, to attend last chance resolution sessions or mediation sessions required by the IDA with the authority to execute settlement agreements on behalf of the district following consultation with the superintendent of schools where practical and notification to the board president or vice president in his or her absence of the contents of any settlement agreement for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion passes. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve the following additional appointments? Motion to appoint Teresa Kostakis, the BMS RHS school nurse, and Mary Skeen, the CLS school nurse, as attendance supervisors for the 2018 school year at no additional salary, as included in the duties of school nurse. So moved. Second. I think we can just. I think we can just go. Just read the whole list and vote it. Okay. Motion to appoint the workplace at Mid Hudson Regional Hospital to provide school physician services and Dr. Rajiv Narula. Uh, no. As chief medical officer at the cost of $8,376 for the 2018-19 school year and motion to appoint Sheldon Teeter director of facilities as asbestos designee chemical hygiene officer pursuant to OSHA and school pesticide representative for the school district for the 2018-19 school year and motion to appoint Whitney Drucker secretary to the superintendent as records uh, uh, Mm -hmm. Assistant Officer Thomas Brunell, Assistant Superintendent for Support Services as Records Management Officer, and Joseph L. Phelan, Superintendent of Schools as Records Appeals Officer for the 2018-19 school year at no additional salary. And motion to from the Recreation and Superintendent of Schools to designate building principals Edward Davenport, John Chemnitzer, and Brett King as 2018-19 Dignity Act coordinators for their respective schools as required by the Dignity for All Students Act and by Section Section 9 of Board of Education Policy 5300 Code of Conduct to lead and coordinate the efforts of each school's Dignity for All Students Act team in proactively addressing and responding to any and all incidents of bullying, discrimination, hazing, and or harassment as identified in this state law and board policy. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? That motion is passed. Okay. Motion to direct Thomas Burnell, Assistant Superintendent for Support Services, to make payments of monies for investments, investment on bonds as it becomes due, payments to redeem bonds as they become due, checks to cover payroll and agency account deposits, utility bills, expense payments to employees, and payments under contractual agreements. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? And motion passes. Motion to, to approve the following designations. Motion to designate the M&T Bank, uh, NYLAF, and BNY Mellon as official depositories of funds for the school district for the 2018-19 school year. Other financial institutions will be brought to the board in the course of the year for approval of investment services if necessary. Motion to designate the Daily Freeman as the original district newspaper, official, official dis district newspaper, and the Poughkeepsie Journal designated as the alternate official newspaper for the district for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor. Motion passes. Motion to approve the following authorizations. Motion to authorize Thomas Brunell, Assistant Superintendent for Support Services, and Christine Natale, De District Treasurer, to have access to the safe deposit main maintained by the school district at the M&T Bank for the 2018-19 school year. Motion to authorize petty cash funds at the following locations and in the following amounts for the 2018-19 school year. Location business office, $100, uh, Secretary to Business Administrator, Tax Collection Office, $100, Tax Collector. Chancellor Elementary School, $100, Elementary School Principal. Buckley Middle School, $100, Middle School Principal. Rhinebeck High School, $100, Middle High School Principal. And Interscholastic, $50, Athletic Director. CLS Kitchen, $10, District Treasurer. BMS Kitchen, $60, District Treasurer. And RHS Kitchen, $100, District Treasurer. Motion to authorize Joseph L. Phelan, Superintendent of Schools, to approve transfers to budget codes up to $20,000 for transfer for the 2018-19 school year. Motion to authorize Joseph L. Phelan, Superintendent of Schools, and Thomas Grinnell, Assistant Superintendent for Support Services, as a payroll certification officer for the 2018-19 school year. Motion to authorize Joseph L. Phelan, Superintendent of Schools, to approve or disapprove all conference requests for the 2018-19 school year. Motion to authorize Joseph L. Fallon, Superintendent of Schools, to apply for grants and aid for the school district, state, federal, foundation, and private sources for the 2018-19 school year. 
and motion to delegate the Board of Education's authority pursuant to Commissioner's Regulation 100.2 Y to Joseph L. Fallon, Superintendent of Schools, to have full and final authority to make determinations regarding student residency. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I have a question <clears throat> on C, on the change from 5,000 to 20,000. Is, is that this year, is that new this year, or and what month is that? In the spring, they reviewed the the business office policies, and it was recommended to increase it to twenty thousand. Oh, so the board. So the yeah, the policy committee made the recommendation. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? This motion pass. Motion to readopt all previous board policies and the code of ethics. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor. Motion to approve that the meetings of the Board of Education of the Rhinebeck Central School District be held on the dates indicated on the schedule submitted at 7 p.m. in the high school middle school library for the 2018-19 school year or in alternative locations or times as noted on the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to bring to the board's attention, you have a copy of the meeting schedule at your, at your places there, um, that um, September 11th, is uh, September 9th at sundown is the start of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Yes, thank you. And it goes until sundown on September 11th. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of the fact that, again, I don't think it's an issue because typically we're not meeting until evening, but I'd rather bring it up now and have somebody throw a red flag on the on the on the, the pitch and say, "No, we shouldn't do that. We should make it another night." I just want to bring it to your attention. That's all. That's all. Sort of just point of information. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor? Motion to adopt the per mile reimbursement rate set by the Internal Revenue Service, which currently is 0.545 cents for approval for approved use of personal vehicles on school business subject to change of the Internal Revenue Reimbursement Rates. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? The motion passes. Motion to approve the following resolution. Be it resolved that effective July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019, the Rhinebeck Central School District will waive the finger fingerprinting fee of $99 for all new employees who are hired to work less than 20 hours per week or receive a salary of $30,000 or less, except for per diem substitutes. The district will reimburse per diem substitutes for this expense after the completion of 10 days of work and the submission of proof of payment documentation. The district will pay this fee in advance for all others as outlined above. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? The motion passes. Motion to accept the list of New York State certified impartial hearing officers for Dutchess County for the 2018-19 school year as updated by the New York State Education Department in accordance with section 200.31 of the Commissioner's Regulation for the purpose of conducting special education impartial hearings with compensation of such impartial hearing officers in accordance with board policy. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. Motion to appoint Shaw, Perlson, May, and Lambert LLP attorneys at law as school attorneys for the 2018-19 school year at a retainer fee of $32,000 and such, a, such attorney as assigned as investigator for the Title IX, Title VII, and other matters of the 2018 school year, if and as needed. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion to approve all persons in positions required by law or regulation to be bonded. Example, de deputy treasurer, central treasurer, activity fund, claims auditor, deputy claims auditor, purchasing agent in the amount of 100,000 per employee per occurrence, 1 million per occurrence for the tax collector, 1 million per occurrence for the treasurer for the 2018-19 school year. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor. Motion passes. Motion to approve the following resolution. Be it resolved, the Board of Education of the Rhinebeck Central School District here, hereby appoints Thomas Burnell, Assistant Superintendent for Support Services, as trustee, and Joseph L. Fallon, Support 
Superintendent of Schools as alternate trustee representing the Rhinebeck Central School District for the Dutchess County Workers' Compensation Cooperative effective July 1, 2018 to serve in such capacity until the appointment is rescinded by the board or another individual is appointed in his place. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. Motion to through the following resolution. Be it resolved, the Board of Education of the Rhinebeck Central School District hereby appoints Thomas Purnell, Assistant Superintendent for Support Services, as trustee, and Joseph L. Fallons, Superintendent of Schools, as alternate trustee, representing the Rhinebeck Central School District for the Duchess Educational Health Insurance Consortium, effective July 1, 2018, to serve in such capacity until the appointment is rescinded by the board or another individual is appointed in his place. So we'll move. Second. Any discussion? All in favor. Motion. Okay. Take a breath. Take a breath. Take a breath. Take a bottle of water or some fresh fruit. It's already on it, so no problem. All right. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes of the June 26, 2018 regular meeting? So moved. Any? No. Second. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Corrections. Uh, excuse me, I just, uh, Laura had brought up a correction. Uh, Whitney made it, so what you have in front of you is correct right. per, per Lars. Uh, so the minutes as amended. Or as, as or presented. Present. Okay, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Uh, abstain? Motion passes. Now we have time for public comment. Uh, seeing no public, mm -hmm. we'll move on to reports and discussion for the 2018-19 board goal development process. Okay, just want to keep it on there until we have some, I have some indication from the board members as to whether we want to uh, establish a, a separate standalone, not connected with a board meeting, uh, board workshop to develop goals for the coming year, or whether it's the uh, interest of the board to say come in early and tag it on to the front end of a another board meeting. So it's really up to it's at the pleasure of the board. Uh, Who are we deciding tonight? We don't have to, but I just keep it on our agenda so we don't let it uh, get away from us. And, and just so everybody remembers. We're meeting again in terms of regular meetings on July 31st, August 14th, and August 28th. Would everyone prefer to have it as a separate meeting? Would that be everybody's preference? I'd prefer to have it on a meeting night. We could. Is that everybody's preference? Because that just narrows it down for. Yeah, it's <laughs> down to shapes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Is everyone here in all those meetings? Like, You're I'm, not, I'm here not here on the 31st. I'm not here on the 31st. Uh, the 14th. 14th. I have not heard anybody say that they are not available on the 14th or the 28th yet. So <coughs> it might make sense to ma like maybe that. go with the 14th yeah. if everybody has indicated. No. Um, absent some something that comes up. Obviously. Six o'clock. So uh, that one. Uh, Thirty. Five. I, six o'clock and we start at seven. I. I I think that would be coming. I mean, miraculous, but mm -hmm. well, what's the earliest everyone can get here? Yeah, I mean, it could take right. oh, six o'clock. Is the earliest you can get here? Yeah. We could provide dinner that night too, if that's an issue. Yeah, yeah we, we certainly could. What's that? We, we could, could provide, provide dinner if that's dinner, so people. Could, oh, okay. If it came right uh, from work or something of that nature. It probably will take longer than an hour. Just yeah. Even yeah. even if we send stuff ahead of time, like it yeah. could take longer. Is 5.30 going to be okay? The more time we have, the more likely yeah. we'll be done by the time the board meeting starts. Or we could always get this to do it another night or another day. That's, or have part two, the second one. Right. Yeah, that's if we don't awesome. finish, then you've got August mm -hmm. 28th to come in. There you go. Yeah. I mean, there's no right or wrong. It's okay. what you guys want, what works in your schedule. So why don't we see if there's another date that works? And if not, you know, we'll keep the August 14th. Is that what? That's not no. what I was hearing, but no, no, you know, I'm not start hearing. on the 14th yeah. at 5:30. Oh, start with, okay. And then if we have to go over to the 28th, okay. we'll deal with it on the that. 14th. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Okay. And when then did you get that now? 
Okay. And then I think like last time, people want to submit their ideas ahead of time. Yeah. That that gets a lot of work yes, started. Yes, that's a good thing. Sure. Okay, that's a good. And could that be emailed to Laura Lundman? Definitely to Laura. In previous years. <laughs> Uh, I hear I hear she didn't in Costa Rica for five weeks. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I, I, think, I think you want to have a, a deadline date by which people get their stuff in, though. So you know we're not scrambling the day before. Well, you know, maybe by the thirty first. I was. You I read my mind. Yeah, I was going to say just to keep us on track. If people shoot for getting them into Laura by July thirty first, that way we got a little time between the 31st and the 14th to uh, massage them, we work, you know, kind of get them ready to actually sit there and say, does this do it for all yeah. seven board members or not? So I think that's a good timeline. Okay. Okay. Right? okay, committee reports, uh, finance. And uh, the items we discussed, first off, the state aid reimbursements. In previous years, programs such as Camp Rambo and Arts and Education have been paid through BOCES, which then makes the program eligible for BOCES aid, a 50% return the following year. The question is, do we want those returned money to be put toward the next year, and would the PTSO or the RSF reject that plan? The second item was cafeteria participation. Reviewing per cafeteria participation for the past four years, we can note that there was an increase in participation when Larry Anthony joined our district in the 2015-16 school year, that there was a slight decrease when new regulations came into effect on the 2016-17 school year. Perhaps less sodium, high fiber, less sugar was of less interest. And that there had been a steady increase of free and reduced meals. Note that the percentage of free and reduced meals is increasing with decreasing enrollment. The third item was cafeteria profit and loss. Our revenue for 2017-18 is in the positive, but please note that June is not included and participation drops off at the end of the school year. We have a payment to Red Hook in excess of $4,000. The district is reassessing the after-school snack program, confirming that the program is covering labor costs not losing money, and at minimum breaking even. The Pine Plains food director is retiring, and their district has approached us asking for a possible three-way share, Red Hook, Rhinebeck, and Pine Plains. We have met a few times discussing the possibility, bearing in mind that for our district, the top priorities are no additional cost, no compromising the quality of our program, and that it is feasible for Larry's schedule. There is potential for savings as Pine Plains is hiring someone to do paperwork and sharing that service, but we are still assessing and working with lawyers regarding the details. We can do a year-long test run, and if it is not satisfactory, get out of the agreement. Number four was ban renewal, bond anticipation note renewal. Our bid went out for $3.2 million, and Oppenheimer and Company won the bid based on providing the best interest rate. Of the $3.2 million, 1.2 million was borrowed of June last year for paying the architect, the construction manager, and testing. The additional 2 million is for telephone system with access control, windows, windows, walls being fabricated, expenses, and materials. Our rating is AA3, which stayed the same as last year and is based on our financial statement. The fifth item was ESSA. Financial reporting requires us to break down expenditures by each building. Transportation may not be included. Once we get more direction, we'll move forward. The next meeting for the Finance Committee is the first week of August before the 13th audit. Respectively submitted, Liz Ron. Um, so I wanted to ask about uh, item three, the first paragraph. Um, am I understanding correctly that if you take the $4,000 payment that's still owed to Red Hook into consideration, that the program may not be in a positive position? Well, since then, and we've had the close of the year, it, it looks, we haven't closed the books officially, uh -huh. but it looks very good that we're in a positive this year. Oh, okay. 
That's so, quite a shift. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So. I don't think I've ever heard those words. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you did, but that was when we had a management company here, and it wasn't no, allowed to be a negative. <laughs> so, yeah. We haven't been in the, a positive since mm -hmm. the management company, but uh, so that's, that's good news. That's right. We're going in a good direction. Right. I have a couple questions. Um, so what do we currently do with the state aid that we get back from um, the arts and education? And it goes into our revenues. Uh, I mean, that's in your part of your budget. This is one of the things that would happen if, give you an example, we do get uh, grants uh, and various things that we use for educational programs, arts and education, some environmental programs that are purchased through BOCES, and our aid ratio is approximately 50%. So if the program costs $10,000 the following year, we'd get $5,000 back, basically. Right. Just as a, a rough example. Um, the issue would be, though, if, if we were going to apply it to the following year's program or give it back to that program, we would have to take it out of the revenue portion of our budget, thereby finding more places to cut, unfortunately. So. So the idea of the of of, of and, and where the the finance committee was on this is to make no changes as it is and to apply for grants and see whether or not there's any f feedback from our granting uh, partners to see whether or not they have any issues with it and it's, so far we haven't heard of any and. Uh, but if it did, it would cause a little bit of a, I want, it's not a cash flow issue. It's, it would be a budgeting issue. So if you saw, let's take that same instance, we were getting $5,000 back for that. And let's say our aid, our aid runs came out and it said, in BOCES aid, 300,000, I'm only gonna budget 295. So that means that's $5,000 we're looking for, it's except it's on the revenue side, but I mean, you look over on the expenditure side too, narrow it down. That's a figure that changes. I mean, if they give less to arts and ed, then that's Oh, certainly. Bad. Oh, yeah. So it it changes all the time. And, and that aid ratio isn't always 50%. It's gone up a little bit. It goes down a little bit. But we're usually somewhere between 45 and 50 when it comes to our right. BOCES aid. But there's deductions off those totals, too. So it's not strictly right. uh, in dollar for dollar. Depends on the program. Okay. My other question is, is this uh, the prime plan, is this, uh, are we moving ahead with this or is it still in? Uh, it, it appears so, so far. Uh, Red Hook has worked out a, a, an agreement uh, that I've read through and I'm perfectly fine with it. I mean, it, no additional cost to us. Um, but it is being reviewed by their attorneys and you remember that he, Larry, is an employee of the Red Hook School District. So Red that's Hook controls four thousand dollars. Right, right. That's, that, that's we were a month behind and get it. Well, they didn't bill us. Until and Larry feels like he can do this. I mean, yes, he does. It works and so well. I know. I know that. I know that. And you, it, it is a one-year pilot program. Uh, it, if Pine Plains agrees to it all, and the person who uh, the additional person who's being hired actually is is also going to be a Red Hook employee, not a Pine Plains employee. Uh, that way it would be under all one umbrella and not part of Larry's person who's in charge as a Pine Plains employee. Right. <laughs> so it is going to be a Red Hook employee. That was decided afterwards that okay. it's all going to stay under Red Hook. But hopefully that they'll be picking up some of the reporting duties. So we'll take some relief off of Christine Natoli's desk mm -hmm. and it would free her up to do things. But pretty much not a lot will change on our things. I think there are a couple of positives that we thought about was is that it will enable us by picking up the other school district to have more people potentially available to be substitutes or to to or look for employment here um so um would larry be around as much as he currently is no there's no doubt about that we, we know that that's a, that's not going to happen um, so what is, is he here now two days a week is yeah basically about 40 percent of the Would time that go down in one day or is that no it's it's kind of kind of going to be a floating type of a thing and see where it is we know in the beginning he's going to spend more time up in pine plains right. just because that will be new to them and once they got their operations down then things could go back to normal as far as that's concerned 
Um, I think what's occurred over the past couple of years, too, with Larry being here, a, a lot of our staff has taken a lot of some of that work on that's typically the director's thing about ordering foods and things of that nature. So they the staff is taking right. responsibility for that. They're doing the production records. He's just making sure it's on, they're on top of it. Um, if, if we find that there is a, a, enough savings where we're going to be in the black, one of the things that Larry and I have discussed is to make one person each of the three uh, kitchens to be the lead in those kitchens and pay them a little bit more per hour so they are responsible for everything that comes out of there, responsible for how they deal with the students, deal with the staff, getting everything in together as far as production records and all the record keeping that they have to do, contacting parents who may owe money and not that falling on, you know, right. Larry, which he's doing right now, but I think that's going to be the overwhelming part. And that's also where that other clerical help will help out. It'll be in Red Hook. They, that person will be able to contact Ryan Beck parents anytime that someone goes into such a negative balance that it warrants reaching out to them. So I, I, I see that this is just going to be a one year trial, but I, I'm just wondering, like, if it's a complete disaster for some reason, you know, come November. You know, contractually, are we going to be locked into the year, or if it, you know, if it just is a complete mess? I just don't want to. You know, I'll have to remember if it's a uh, if there is like a um, like a thirty or sixty day notice to get out of it, or whether or not it's a one time a year. Like in April, we discuss: Are we going to keep this going for the following year? I think it's more along that line, to tell you the truth, because trying to find somebody in the middle of the year to take over a program would be a lot to, for Pine Plains to take on. Uh, because Pine Plains realizes that, that the Red Hook, Rhinebeck, that's staying together. It's whether or not we would continue to have Pine Plains in the mix. And to leave them in the middle of the year, that's kind of not, we, we agreed to do this as a one-year pilot, but if it doesn't work, we're out of it. And, uh, I think it was more of an issue up in Red Hook than it is here. Right. Well, I didn't want to lay the one screaming because mm -hmm. it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm not. Well, it's, you know, when you go into a pilot, you don't know how it's going to turn out for sure. I mean, we we had a good feeling that he'll be able to handle it based on his track record. I, I would I would sense that the worst case scenario would be, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, those of you out in the <laughs> video land, but uh, that after a period of time, he might draw the conclusion that, wow, I'm working myself to the bone here, it just isn't working, let's get through the year and then we'll go back to the old situation. But we're trying, and, and part of it is also, and we certainly don't lose money, especially since we're starting to have to break even legitimately, um, but we're also, you know, doing this in the spirit of cooperation and shared services, which, you know, a lot of school districts talk the talk, but we're trying to walk the walk, and there's only way, one way we're going to know, and that's give it a shot. And we think it's worth yeah. a try, yeah. but it if is. it doesn't work, then this will be la it'll be a one and done, okay. and we'll keep, you know, the, the finance committee will be as they have been all along, we'll be tracking that with us and we'll be watching it very closely. We want this to work. Okay. Any other questions? Long range planning. Excuse me, Laura. Where's the floor? Where's the floor? Wait, where is that one? Is that in here? 422. Yes, 422. Out on the outside. Uh, I got it. Okay, so uh, we met after. Um, CAC uh, meeting with the, the public, with the committee. Um, we didn't have the results of, of what they wanted as far as data collection and things like that, but we did go over a letter that um, Lloyd wrote to, to Joe, um, really about the CDEP plan and, and how that ties into our uh, core values. And one of the questions of that meeting was, uh, can we rewrite the core values? So I think 
we all thought that that was really um, integral to the CDEP plan and maybe we'll invite Marvin to the next meeting with the CAC committee to kind of go through that plan a little bit more detail and, and show how there's a human side to that equation. Um, we also seem to be a lot more emphasis from the committee on uh, kind of not state testing results and, and looking more at, at other things. Um, what we wanted to do was kind of pull those committee because um, most of them are, are new to the district and ask them why they moved here. You know, but how did you find out about Ryan Beckham? It wasn't state tests or college entry, you know, numbers. But what drove you here? So maybe try to get them to really realize that those tests are important for what it's worth. Um, we also talked about the different levels of students looking at forecast five and, and you know, kind of in the middle and the top and, and where we fit in there. Um, wanted to look at, maybe take a field trip to some of the other schools, Plumbrook and Rhinebeck. Um, they're a little bit larger than Rhinebeck, so they might be, not be healing, hitting the same problem that we're hitting. Um, but we looked at Haldane in a little bit more detail. Um, their enrollment's lower, it's about 827, and they went through a very uh, big strategic plan, which uh, looks like it worked and their test scores kind of went up and staff numbers kind of changed and stuff. So we wanted to talk to the former superintendent, uh, Dr. Diane Bowers, to see you know how that process went and what they learned from it and maybe we can get some, some information from them. Um, we're going to get the uh, compiled list and notes from the group and we'll share that when we get it and looking to take some field trips over the summer if we have scheduled get it in and then our next meeting is July 25th, August 13th and August 29th. Grindbeck uh, collaboration? Yeah, um, we, we met earlier today so we don't have any notes to, uh, to give you but uh, Mark and I represented the district, uh, Gary uh, Bassett uh, the village mayor represented the village. Uh, Spinsia was not able to attend the meeting today. Uh, we talked about a few items. I uh, met for about 40 minutes. Uh, uh, mayor Bassett was very appreciative of the letter that I wrote, as well as the letter that Deirdre Dalbert wrote on behalf of the board supporting the grant. They have they have submitted all the paperwork for the grant. Uh, they expect to hear uh, by the end of August uh, as to whether you know they're successful. Uh, he is cautiously optimistic, um, if only because the the uh, the pot of money available is available for only ten counties in New York State, and we are apparently the southernmost of the counties. Uh, so he's feeling like we're not uh, competing with Long Island or Westchester County for these monies. We're essentially competing with, with school districts and counties that at least go further north and, and perhaps further west than, than we. So he's hopeful. Um, and uh, and we, we all uh, uh, agreed on the fact that if they would get the grant, that would be a great thing for the Rhinebeck community, for kids in particular, but for the, for the community in general. We all know that uh, the Village Board has been talking about the sidewalk issue since I've been here, and that's, you know, that's, and probably before that, I'm sure, and that's quite a few years, so uh, we're hopeful that this is gonna break that log jam. And it's totally a money log jam. It's mm -hmm. not that the Village Board isn't interested in spending the money. They, like we, they're, they're a tax cap, and, they don't have the money, but this grant would would bring a very welcome infusion of, of cash to that project. So we, we keep our fingers uh, crossed. Um, and uh, one of the issues that uh, oh Gary also talked about uh, the uh, the ongoing collaboration, uh, especially between the school district and the village. Um, They've got, uh, I, one of our students is working there uh, this summer. I'm not sure whether he's getting paid or is volunteering, but he's working with records management with the village and has done it, this is the second year he'll be doing that and uh, spoke very highly of that uh, 
that collaboration. Um, what was the other thing you mentioned, uh, Mark? And, uh, Oh, they had they had asked us to uh, uh, to to post a uh, an opening that the village had. They were looking to hire some some summer help, some paid summer help, um, and uh, asked me if we would be willing to. Posted this job posting in our high school. Uh, I think thinking that uh, they might get some some high school kids who would be interested. And um, you know, I decided to post it in all three of our buildings. Not that I was expecting middle school kids or elementary school kids to apply. Although he said a few elementary school kids did apply. Even he said it was cute, I and mean, they they definitely could not have done the work that they wanted done but I put it there mainly to see if some of our 10-month employees who are unemployed during the summer might be interested in working there and in fact they got some of our employees applied as well as some of our kids I'm not sure who they hired actually I think they were gonna make that appointment or those appointments at their village board meeting tonight but he was appreciative of us helping them generate a candidate pool for the, for the open summer positions uh, I brought up an issue, um, and, and I, I want to just bring you up to speed on it. Um, I have, and, and I think you have this letter somewhere at your place as, as an FYI. Uh, I, I have attended so far this year, uh, representing our school district, uh, uh, an opioid summit that um, uh, that uh, Senator Serino and, uh, uh, and Mark Molinaro have, have held. One was in the fall, one was uh, just about a month, month, a month and a half ago. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the focus of this was uh, to bring school people and uh, community service providers uh, you know, uh, agencies that uh, uh, help, uh, uh, you know, help substance abusers detox and, and that. There was some, some law enforcement there. Just to talk about what's going on in our county regarding, uh, regarding what's happening nationwide. And, uh, everybody's calling the opioid crisis. Um, they did not, for whatever reason, and I'm not, Second guessing that, but they did not invite um, uh, municipal representatives. For example, Mayor Bassett and uh, 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 Supervisor Spinzi, thank you, were not invited, nor, nor from any of the other uh, municipalities in the county. And it did come up at that the second meeting that. Uh, in, the, in the discussion amongst the 30 some odd people who were there that it might be a good idea for the municipalities to kind of get involved in this. It, this isn't a school problem, it's not an agency problem, it's not a police problem, it's well, everybody's problem. Um, so I did uh, broach the topic with, uh, with Mayor Bassett and ask him if, if he would be willing to collaborate on bringing some kind of um, uh, an educational or an awareness program to Rhinebeck. Not as a school program, as a community program sponsored by the school district, the town, and the village, just to let people know what's going on. Not to make it a necessarily a, a law enforcement centric thing, but to provide information to people so they know that we're no different than any other community in this country and that problem exists here as well as other places but it does exist here to think that we're in this bubble where substance abuse isn't happening and uh, the statistics that I'm hearing from this opioid summit that I've attended is that the vast majority of 
people in Dutchess County anyway who are uh, who are abusing uh, opioids are uh, people in their uh, early to mid 20s through their 30s and we're not talking about a middle school problem we're talking about uh, adults and uh, they're even seeing a spike in uh, in opioid abuse among people in their 50s into their 60s so it's not a kid problem it's not a school problem it's a community problem uh, Gary Bassett was uh, very very open to the idea we threw around names of some people that both that he is both going to contact to see if they might be interested in participating as well as some contacts that I have more on a on a county level uh, he's going to talk with uh, Supervisor Spinzia to see if she would be interested in pursuing this. We're meeting again uh, in early August to see where we're at, to see if we can go forward with something uh, where all three of, of our organizations are collaborating. So I just want to give you a heads up before you may have heard it someplace else, and we'll pursue it and keep you posted. So that's just going to let you know. Uh, about that as well, and I think that kind of covered everything we, we discussed. So, just want to bring you up to speed on our Ryan Beck collaboration meeting earlier today. Thank you both for attending sure. and yeah. bringing up that important. Yeah, the conversations have been good too. Okay, um, I think we're up to we're good, good, new, good news. Good news. Well, we were visited by three balloons uh, on <laughs> Sunday morning. Did they uh, land here? Oh, yeah, three oh. of them landed on our campus. Um, yeah, okay, okay. nothing bad to report about it. It was kind of <laughs> exciting. I wasn't up here to see them, but I did see photos on Facebook. So uh, <laughs> they, were, they were here. And, and Gary said that uh, two of them, because Gary lives on the other side of the, you know, on Manor, uh, so he's, his backyard abuts the school district property. Uh, and uh, he said one of them landed like over towards kind of like the high school cafeteria side so they were able to get their chase vehicle there they didn't have to leave the the paint the black top they, they brought it down like right there the other two that came down over here came down further out on the field and he said that the uh, the two chase vehicles uh, did not drive on our lawns they sent people out there from their chase crew and they dropped a tether or they somehow hooked up and those people brought the two balloons which were you know, a few feet off the ground still barely hovering close to the blacktop so they did all their work without having to to drive on our fields and he said they were like incredibly respectful of the school district property in doing that so I just wanted to pass that along to you and uh, aside from the school angle I thought it was a great event that it brought a lot of people into town and a lot of people into the at least into the restaurants and places I was passed and by and that's what it's all about so that's my good news for the, for the night. The work is beginning on the um, exercise equipment. Oh yeah we we'll check out the Twitter feed today. Uh, stuff's going up already and uh, We've, uh, we've had, we're going to be, uh, when they get more work done, uh, we're going to be, the uh, Ryan Beck Interact Club has volunteered to, uh, to rake mulch or whatever mulchish product they're putting there to, to cushion people who might fall. Uh, so they're going to be raking out the, the stuff uh, as soon as they make, make a little more progress. But they're, they're moving along. If you haven't seen it, check out the Facebook page or, or the, the Twitter account. Posted a picture just this morning. Good. Actually, I think I'm playing around it. Yeah. Exercise. Thing. That's inviting. Yeah. Any I'm not sure news? about that. <laughs> <laughs> any other good news? Okay. Old business? I don't have any. Are we all set for the um, the convention? We are not. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Whitney is has been taking names. A number of you have responded. Uh, so we would like to be ready to register 
people by mid-July, which means it's, it's coming up. Uh, as we mentioned before, we can register people later. Okay. But it's uh, like with, with everything else in this world, it's more expensive to register later. I, I doubt, please don't hold me to this, but I doubt they would run out of registrations. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest, the bigger issue would be lodging. Um, I'll take that on. It's just with a new job. No, I, no, I, I, I get it. So, uh, we, when we get to like probably uh, next week, we'll send out kind of a last. Here's who's told us they want to go, and and we're going to register by like the end of next week. If you want in the first wave, and your name's not on this list, let us know. If you want to register later, let us know when you're ready to commit, and we'll do what we can. Okay. So. Is there, can you cancel? Like, if you register and there's then a fee. You, there's, there's a fee. There's a fee. Yeah, really. Make there's it difficult. One way or another. They make it there's difficult, right? <laughs> you know, there, there's a fee for cancel. Um, Jeff. Yes. I, I am interested in it. Yes. Does, does Whitney know that? Yes. I okay. Sure. Here. Here. But I'm, I will also be interested in going to the school law. Uh, Pre-session. Yeah, Whitney mentioned that to me earlier. So okay. uh, again, we'll register whomever wants to okay. go where. It's July 16th. So oh, July 16th, 16th it opens. At 10 a.m. Uh, registration. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So oh, I have to register you for the conference in order to register you for hotel. Right. So that's probably that's probably the first. Mm-hmm. Just so. Well, I don't know if I what day is the 16th? It's coming up. Um, it's the 10th, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So we really ought to know by the end of this week and then register register Monday. I don't remember okay. if I don't think okay. there was an agenda. And one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, put these at your at your place. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't get any kind of uh, kickback from getting people to go, but there are two things. One is for the NISBA law conference, uh, which is being held on the 24th in Latham and on the 27th of July, that is, in White Plains. Those are the ones that are closest to us. Uh, and the uh, Mid-Hudson School Study Council's uh, annual law conference uh, is on August 3rd, which is a Friday uh, down in uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, if you're interested, that's those registrations are coming up. Yeah, the registration quick. is next week for this one. How different is the agenda for that to NISBA? Like, will that stuff be covered at NISBA? Or it's, there's some overlap, but it's worth going though. I think. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, and I don't want to leave anybody out by failing to mention their names, but I remember uh, Laura and I went to both of them, and I think the only overlap was uh, was uh, Jay Morona's. Shtick. He's, he's the he's yeah. the, uh, the NISBA attorney. That was similar, right. but I'd say better than half or three quarters of both of them were were different. So it depends on really how much right. time you, you you can spare. But going to one, I think, would be better than going to none if you're able to to go. And they both they, they're both good. So uh, just let us know so we can. We can register you. Uh, is there anything else that I needed to remind people with me? Can you remember? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, another chance for public comment. Still no public, so yeah. any other? I do. Um, so I just want to let everybody know that uh, you recall the last meeting we had a um, presentation by BOCES about their upcoming project and really more about the financing piece of it. Uh, we'll have to be voting here in July about um, you know, how we're gonna, whether we're gonna go on the intermunicipal agreement to finance the project or whether uh, we won't. If we go on the intermunicipal agreement, then we can get our own financing for our portion of the project. Um, and you'll recall that I mentioned at the last meeting that um, BOCES really hasn't put out a lot of information about the project itself and they actually came to the meeting that night to discuss the financing piece of it. Um, so within a couple of days of our meeting, I, and actually it was in the newspaper also, but uh, I got a 
uh, email from Dr. Hooley from BOCES um, wanting to, you know, meet with me or, you know, talk on the phone about the project and, you know, ha having heard what I had to say at the meeting. Um, so uh, last week I did have a conversation with Dr. Hooley on the phone. We spent about a half an hour on the telephone. Um, and he did assure me that uh, BOCES does plan to put out more information about the project, uh, you know, and they will make an effort to come to another board meeting and, um, you know, bring drawings and things like that so they can really show us what the project is about. I really stressed to him that, um, you know, in my mind, it's really a worthwhile project, but if they want it to pass, we really need to get the word out to the public that this is what we're doing and what the efficiencies are and, you know, that there's money to be saved and, and those kind of things in order to make the public aware about it and come out and vote in favor of it. So um, I think it was a productive discussion and uh, so there's more to come in that area. But they will be coming out again and, you know, make public presentations and inviting people to come to campus to see what they're doing and things like that so that people get an idea what the project's about. That's nice, got a call right away. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you can tap back uh, Bill Kimball's somewhat, somewhat I don't think it's gonna over the top, <laughs> in my opinion, article. I mean, he, he made it sound, I thought, and I, I expressed this to Dr. Kelly as a step. I think it sounded like worse than it went, but the questions did come up and the questions were legit. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to hear that he, mm -hmm contacted you to try to address those questions. Watch our, our tape to see how it really works. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were legitimate questions. Mm -hmm. they're, awesome. they're still out there about the tax gap. But yeah. Okay. Any, any other other? Okay. I can have a motion upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve the following consent items. So we. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Motion passed. All of those motions wow. passed. Wow. That's much nicer, isn't it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> my have to get out of here. Okay. Motion on the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve as a first reading the modifications to board policy 5300, district code of conduct 5410, wellness, and 8530 cafeteria meal charges. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Motion On the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to adopt the following resolution. Whereas the Dutchess Board of Cooperative Education Services, Dutchess County, New York, BOCES, is proposing to undertake a project consisting of the following improvements at the BOCES campus on Salt Point Turnpike, minor additions and renovations of certain existing facilities, construction of a new alternative high school building, addition of parking, wastewater treatment, and possible, uh, possibly water supply facilities to accommodate these improvements and the acquisition of original furnishings, equipment, machinery, and apparatus required in connection with the purpose for which such buildings, facilities, and improvements are to be used. The project at an estimated cost of $36,800,000 and whereas BOCES has requested that each of its 13 component districts, the component districts including the Rhinebeck Central School District, enter into a joint agreement with respect to the project and whereas the joint agreement sets forth the cost of the project provides for an allocation and appropriation of a said cost among the component school Portion. districts. Portion. Mm -hmm. To the resident weighted average daily attendance value assigned to each component school district for the 2018-19 fiscal year, fiscal year and sets forth the proportion of said cost to be provided by each such component school district in accordance with such all allocation and appointment and whereas upon ex execution and delivery of the joint agreement by each of the components districts, BOCES will schedule a capital project referendum requesting voter approval of the project, and whereas the Board of Education of the district desires to authorize the execution and delivery of the joint agreement by the district. <coughs> now therefore be resolved by this Board of Education as follows. Section one, the form and substance of the joint agreement in substantially the same, the form presented to this meeting are hereby approved in a Execute, execution and delivery of the joint agreement by the district are hereby authorized. 
The President of the Board of Education is hereby authorized on behalf of the district to execute and deliver the joint agreement. The joint agreement shall be in substantially the form thereof presented to this meeting and such changes, variation, omissions, and insertions as the President of the Board of Education shall approve the execution therefore by the President to constitute conclusive evidence of such approval. Section 2, this resolution shall take effect immediately upon its adoption. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, I just, I, I, I apologize because I wasn't here for the discussion of the, uh, of the project, but if we don't approve it, but the project gets approved by the voters, then what is the, I, I know there was some discussion of the uh, cost being higher to each component district because they'll have to fund it individually. Um, but is it compulsory that the districts fund it if they don't do it through the joint agreement? Yes, if they don't do it through the joint agreement and it passes, which is my understanding, then any of the districts who don't, who aren't part of that joint agreement, uh, they're talking about using the dormitory authority for funding, which as they presented at our last meeting, would be a higher cost, percentage-wise, higher expense to the districts. But that would be compulsory. The district would have to do that. They couldn't just say, we opt out, we won't. No, there's no opting out. Okay. So the if, the vote, if the voters, well, it's, it's really a matter of the funding. Either we want to all be in it together, all 13 districts together, and fund it at this level, or if even just, as I understand it, if even one of the 13 districts says, for whatever reason, I don't know, no, we're not going to be in that joint agreement, then, then everybody's talking about having to finance it through that. Through that. Okay. Uh, I guess there could be, and I think Mark may have brought this up at our last meeting, there could be political reasons why a school district might decide, no, we're not going to be part of this uh, collaborative funding of this project should it pass. Uh -huh. I'm not saying that would be good or bad, yeah. but it kind of, I'll say it, it kind of sticks it to the other districts to have to get funding of their portion at a higher right. higher cost. Well, but, but the district that said no would also be paying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. May or may not. Like That's the issue. DASNY will have a set rate, mm -hmm. whatever that may be. Each district would then individually go out to get their bond. You're all individually out there on the market. You oh, so may or may not get as good as rate as DASNY. Some districts in our county may not. Mm -hmm. If your credit rating yeah, wasn't good, it, it depends on where your credit rate Probably definitely cost you more. Right. So that's, that's the issue. And that's why we do want to go be able to, first of all, sell it at $36.8 million, uh, and then be able to go out and get funding, which should be lower than going through DASNY. Um, but what would happen if we don't all agree to do it this way, I can't remember, was $1.6 million higher or $1.7 million higher? It may come with a higher borrowing rate, too, on top of it. So. Thank you. But all will be subject to the voters of Dutchess County. Any other discussion? All in favor? <coughs> that motion passes. Any executive session? Okay. Okay. Meeting adjourned. What?